subject I return to again this week is the cross of Christ. Um, I want to offer some observations to tell you how this type of a message preached in simplicity. You notice I haven't been doing any translation. I'll tell you where it's added by the translators, but I haven't gone into linguistics. I haven't been trying to keep it simple, right? But even simple messages can be perverted. Doesn't take much. I happen to be up early one night or late. I don't know what, when or how or what, but thought, ah, eh, turn on the TV. You know, sometimes that puts you to sleep. And um, actually, an evangelist that I thought just got swallowed up by the earth <laughs> is on late night TV. Uh. And um, so I thought, oh, let's take a look and see what's going on in TV land. Now, it's very interesting to me that this particular individual just happens to be preaching on the cross. Just, I, you know, listen, there's such things as coincidence, right? Whatever. But here's where I have to, and I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm going to tell you why. Um, even in simple messages, the need to stay true to what is being said. So I started listening and just kind of curiosity more, spectatorship, if you will. And as I have shared with you many times, I love anything that is history or archaeology that may tie into the Bible. I don't tend to camp out on those subjects as an apologetics tool, like, well, if I show you this, then you'll be convinced. But if it happens along the way, you know my love of history and archaeology. Um, so I have no problem with where this individual starts, which is the telling of, uh, there's, there's a lot of cross being mentioned, and then there's the telling of the story of the mother of Constantine, which I've told many times, uh, but I've told it in a different light, and it's, I've told it in its truest recorded form because I don't know that anybody can possibly say specifically, but you know when you hear lore versus hearing fragments or historically recorded fragments. So I've told you about Constantine's mother, Helena, setting out on a journey as an elderly woman going to look for uh, any remains, any findings that she could that would give validity to the crucifixion, the cross, the events, anything. But she specifically set out and makes her journey. What is recorded for us is that she found a pile of wood. It was pointed out to her, actually. She didn't go find it. Somebody said there's, there's wood that was most possibly belonging to crosses, which then turned into a a lore. We have no way of knowing. There was no forensics back then. But this individual is telling the story of Helena. And here's where we go off the deep end. So in this story now that turns from history to lore, because we don't have proof of this, but accordingly, they brought out the three crosses because they could not determine which one was the cross of Christ. Now that presupposes that the crosses were A, intact, which we know from Roman tradition, um, they were famous for using and reusing wood, uh, particularly when wood happened to be at a shortage at some point. They reused what they could, which means who, who knows how many recyclings that went through. I'm just saying, and I'm being real about this. We don't know. We, it's not as though we had someone in that day who, who was an eyewitness who carved a certain something into that particular piece of wood, but even if they did, his lore goes on to say how they laid the first cross out and they brought the sick people to test which one was the real one, and the sick people weren't healed at the first one. They weren't healed with the second one, but they brought the third one out and all the people were healed. And I thought, okay, this is where I have to say, even in teaching simplistically, a theology that is quite complex and bringing it into layman's terms so everyone can understand, leave the lore out of it. And let me tell you 
I'm, I'm just going to say it. It's one part stupidity and one part evil. Because if, if the wood had power, then the wood of the one, this day he'll be with me in paradise, who was forgiven, well, although Christ never touched that man's body, but his words touched his heart, and obviously he was taken with him, it would mean that that very cross that the other man was on would have had the same type of endowment, if you will, because he had faith. When you get into lore, you have to just say, well, that's where Christianity and lore or folklore, there is this bifurcation. So I'm careful when I'm telling you certain things, even in simplicity, that even in simplicity, people can pervert the gospel because what that does inherently is that sets the tone for people to worship things. And as I taught probably, I'm going to say at least 10 years ago, I taught a message at the cathedral on the development of the cross. And I asked the question then, and I'll ask it again now. You know, we have jewelry, and I'm not against wearing a cross as jewelry. I, I wore one for many years. But switch gears a little bit to think of what the cross was to the people in their day and fast forward it to today and you come up to me and you say what what's that around your neck oh it's an electric chair <laughs> now it, it, that's just been recently in the news by an inmate who was recently executed by uh, electric chair so that the image is even fresh in my mind of what that looks like. It is a death machine. There's nothing to be um, venerated about it. Well, people looked at the cross of Christ in Christ's day as a death machine, although not machine, but as a death instrument. There was nothing at all that one would say, apart from rereading the gospel and understanding its role, there would be nothing to glory in it apart from the gospel understanding. And taking a piece of wood to venerate is exactly, by the way, what happened. I've told you all the way it took Martin Luther, and this is not even part of my message, but Martin Luther in his day, as we looked at the life of Martin Luther to get angry enough, the genesis of his, uh, we'll call it the seeds of reformation, before the 95 Thesis were probably ingrained on Halloween when people of the village would pay X amount of dollars to go and venerate, to see, go see the finger. Maybe it was the finger of, um, maybe it was John the Baptist or St. John, John, John's gospel, but the finger of the disciple, and you'd go and you'd pay for it. Let me ask you this question. Why would you venerate? Why would you pay to see this? Well, maybe you'd want to see the freak show. I get it. But why would you venerate that item? Why would you bow down and do obeisance to it? Why would you bow down to a piece of wood? Which is where many people who are not understanding the difference between Protestants and Catholics fail to grab hold of something. I am not against looking, of course, my focus is Christ, the risen Christ, not the dying Christ, not the Christ who looks like many images we have still attached to the cross. So I'm trying to set the stage when I tell you about the cross. The things that I'm highlighting are not about lore. They are not about veneration of lore. But they are for us to better understand, for focus especially on where I'm going today, helps us to understand that there is a lot more at work sometimes when we read the Gospels and we read in simplicity. Sometimes we read over the very things that are, they were placed there with specific design, we can go right over them to see there are deeper meanings, as I've called the tapestry of God's book. You'll find very finely woven details that even we who are very familiar with the Gospels and reading of these passion narratives can go right over and fail to see some of these details. So I hope to highlight those today. I was going to, I'm going to tell you, I was going to jump over John's Gospel uh, for a number of reasons, probably for time, to manage time a little bit better, uh, because this would be, I didn't set out to teach a series on the cross, but this is number seven. Um, I was going to jump right over John and go right into the epistles, but then I started 
kind of focusing, and I said, no, we need to stop here for a minute because especially you who are just starting the journey with me in studying the Bible or you who encounter many people who are just starting the journey who will remark something after reading the Gospels of what is omitted, what is added, or what's here and not there, that each writer has his uh, purpose for including and I've said this before, it is, it's very important to see, for example, Mark's sharp focus, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew's sharp focus of the crucified Messiah with focus on the blood and the blood of the covenant, the blood of the innocent. He's, his focus is there. Um, Mark's depiction, which is actually, we've said Peter's uh, account, which is brief, very seemingly hurried, missing some details, especially when we come to the ending of Mark's gospel, which I have often said the oldest extent manuscripts omit the longer ending. So if we only had Mark's writing, I'm just going to refer to it as Mark's writing, Mark's gospel, we wouldn't have the full picture that Matthew fills in for us they just ran away and they were afraid in Mark's gospel, right? They just run away. That's the, that's the real ending. That's where it ends. They run away and they're freaked out. That's a better way of putting it. We need these other records to fill in what is missing there. And perhaps, as I've said, perhaps there was a longer ending, but we don't have it. And the longer ending that was attached to Mark is, we know, a later edition. That is bona fide. We know that for certain. What I taught about last week, Luke's record of Christ's compassion. And that doesn't mean that Matthew and Mark and John don't record Christ's passion, uh, his compassion rather, but what Luke records underscored and sometimes in a more cryptic way is he's including everybody. It really bothers me when people say, well, uh, the Bible is written and it's skewed this way. Why? That again is error showing that people are not understanding the social times. I mean, we're unfazed by it because of the things we're confronted with on a daily basis. One of our King's Houses from um, down under, and hello, forgot to say hello to you too, but uh, is always kind to send and forward articles to me. This one is about the... Um, church doing uh, celebrations for, uh, I think it's the church, it could be the Church of England, the Church of Australia, I don't remember who exactly, which church it is that is now celebrating uh, trans transgender folks coming out for the first time um, in their kind of reinitiation into the church. I have a problem with that, I'm going to tell you why, but it's not the problem you think. My problem is why would you select a group when, if we're all children of God, if and I don't care what's between your legs or on your chest, if we're all children of God, then you just say, all children of God are welcome into God's church and quit trying to make a spectacle and be social justice warriors for attracting a populace of people that may or may not come. Tell the people that we're all children of God and say all are welcome, which is the message of Jesus Christ, not selective social uh, probing to see who we can get in and who we can maybe change Convert or pervert according to our selective theology. I, listen, I don't, I don't judge. I don't want somebody to judge me. I really don't want to know, and, and I'm saying that in the kindest way. If somebody's preference is one way or another, I've told you some of my friends, and they're longtime friends, and they have been the type of people that have your back are gay and I don't care. So it does not bother you. Why? And now I've said, everybody's welcome here, but don't engage in this. We're going to now highlight this because it, all it is is to show social media and the rest of the world how, how your arms are open. But if you're preaching the message of Christ, why would you need to highlight a group, whether it be divorced, 
whether it be whatever your gender is, why do we have to now highlight people and give them a select calling, just say the children of God, because that's, that's what we all are, children of God, regardless of your color, your gender, or whatever you were raised as. So I, I'm sorry. Back to where I was. <laughs> the compassion of Christ in Luke's writing is unmatched. And we cannot wrap our minds around. It's hard for us to understand that in that day, including women, just even Luke's mention of the fact that women were around Christ and that they played some role. I always go back to Luke 8, that they supported him with their substance. Did Christ need their support? No. We know that he could take little fragments and feed the multitudes. That tells you he didn't need it, but the fact that Luke included them, the fact that Luke is the one that includes all of these outcasts of society, brings them up on the stage and puts them on plane, in fact, in great juxtaposition against the Pharisees and those people of the religious ilk, tells you that he was driving home how this new way flung the door wide open for all to come. And it's what Paul picks up in Galatians, saying there is neither Jew nor Gentile, female or male, bond or free, but all one in Christ, Jesus. So what I love about picking these apart, and that's why I said I cannot pass over John, because it seems as though John, what John does, I've, I've preached many messages, bird's eye view out of John's gospel, if you remember, and I showed bird's eye view that it's unmistakable, even the recorded miracles that take you to, as numbered miracles, signposts, the eighth of them being the resurrection in his gospel. There are so many different ways to approach the study of all of these incredible books, but I, for, this, for the purpose of this message, chose to see and highlight first the thing which I think is common knowledge, John starting his gospel with an eternal perspective. He doesn't feel the need to start telling a genealogy, which Matthew obviously does, and Luke picks up some portion of it. But in John's case, he's talking about something that goes way beyond the birth of a child. For John's purposes, eternal. But if you keep reading, there are some wonderful perspectives because John, it seems, preeminently is concerned with, with unfolding Christ as eternal, king, and king who is very much in control. While I said there are many people who argue about the discrepancies in each of these accounts, um, details omitted or included, I want us to take the approach that sometimes, especially with John, he will give some generic reference with much less, in fact, sometimes no detail at all. And in other places, a detail is included that had it not been for that detail, we would have an incomplete picture elsewhere. I think it is fair to say, how do you record three and a half years, and literally in John's gospel, we're talking about a very little bit of, of eternal and the uh, life, earthly life and ministry of Christ, and the bulk of the book is committed to the final uh, weeks, and perhaps I should say singularly weak, but weeks leading up to Christ's death. How could you possibly make a complete picture in 21 chapters? There wasn't in chapters, but you understand what I'm saying. It's impossible. So from the perspective we're looking at, we're definitely looking at things that, as I said, may be um, for example, one of at least two of the writers chronicling the Passion Week uh, or leading up to Christ's death will record the Last Supper with detail. Whereas in John's Gospel, we're just told that they're, they're having a meal. We're told about the time of the Passover. But John is concerned to weave something infinitely more important than the telling of 
the Last Supper. And that may seem freaky because to us, well, that's, isn't that important? But there's something that he says in the language that he says it, which I will talk about later, which definitely highlights something. We were going through this series of old into the New Testament, focusing on the cross. He does that here. There is no New Testament as he's writing. There is only what he will write and the others that begin to be called New Testament. So there's only the old, and there is more fulfillment, shadows and types with John writing, which again from the eternal perspective is not a mystery to him, that these things are being indeed fulfilled. Um, there's some other references that are omitted, and I could catalog them greatly, like why is Simon uh, not mentioned as the one who is mentioned elsewhere as picking up Christ's cross? that another faith picked up on, the Muslim faith picked up on in the seventh century or so, and said, well, the reason why Simon picked up the cross is because Jesus then, they swapped places, and Simon was the one who died on the cross, and not Christ, he never died. There's a denial of him ever even hanging there. So I'm not saying that John omits that fact for that reason. He just doesn't include it. There are other things, for example, like the mourning women that we looked at last week that John will only kind of pass over and mention as a view distant from the cross. So when people say, well, how come they're not the same? The focus of the one who is recounting may be quite different. When you step away from John's gospel, you come away with something very clear from beginning to end. The mention of John the Baptist at the beginning saying, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, and the emphasis being on Lamb of God, will be almost as though it's a subtext throughout John's gospel. But you have to look for it. And as I said, we'll focus on some things that will help us. But right now I want you to do something. I've taken a long time for introduction. Um, I would like you to turn to John 2.4, although I'm not staying there, I want to show you a reference to show you when I said something else that John is telling us that maybe the others didn't have the same emphasis for is that the king of glory is in control. Now, I've said to you, how can a man manipulate certain things and make all the players take to his advantage to do what needs to be done so that certain things can be fulfilled. It's impossible. But certain sayings that tell you about even from the beginning of his recorded public ministry, he's in control, even though at times we might read and think things have gone wrong and are totally derailed, he's in control. In the first miracle recorded in John's Gospel, which is the marriage in Cana of Galilee, um, it says that, they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And his response to her is, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. My time is not yet. And that's a strange response. Even though he performs the miracle, and it's the first recorded miracle, what a strange thing to say, Mine hour is not yet come. This will be repeated again. I'm trying to show what John's subtext here. Uh, turn to the seventh chapter, and you'll find the same thing being said when they sought to lay hands on him, about the 25th verse in the seventh chapter. They sought to lay hands on him and take him away. And then cried Jesus, verse 28, in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me and know me whence I am, or, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. But then he goes on to say, and this is the, the, the emphasis here, they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And you'll have this repeated again, I believe in the, uh, it's, the 30th verse here, we have it repeated again uh, in, I think, the 8th chapter 
and the 20th verse, again, that his hour has not yet come. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. No man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. And this is why I said to you, he's in control. He's in control when he says, my hour has not yet come. And I've quoted this many times when he says, no man, I'll tell you how, how much I've quoted this is the darn pages now ripped. That's how much I've turned to this page and quoted it, and it's now attached with a paper clip until I can tape it back together. No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I lay it down of my own, and I'll take it again. There is, a, there is a depiction in John of Christ being in control as king, and this is the irony. Careful, careful reading of John has certain highlighted elements as, as I'm kind of weaving them together to show you he's in control of time. For when it says, I don't turn there, but I believe in the 13th chapter concerning Judas, in John's record, Jesus is in control of that time frame as well. And it seems as though, this is the interesting thing, as you get to the 12th chapter, which um, by about the 23rd verse, in my Bible, the header says, Christ's final discourse to the people, which tells you the rest of the book is pretty much dedicated to a very slim uh, amount of time, Jesus answered them. This is when the Greeks sought him out. And that seems to be the, the marker of time when the Greeks sought him out. And we don't know if he talked to the Greeks or not, but when the Greeks sought him out, and then in that same 23rd verse, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So if somebody said, write down key things about John, you definitely say eternal, that's for sure. We know that in the beginning was the word. But then we'd go on to say things like the king, which we'll see even in mockery depicted as king and the highlights of John and the focus of John as a king who is sovereign and in control of all the events. I'm sorry, if I was an outsider looking in and hearing this stuff for the first time, I'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. Too much, too crazy can't be. But you, know, you begin to read this and you think in control of these events and all the way to his arrest, to his uh, trial, you go through everything and you realize king was in control and a special highlight word out of John equally is glory because there's a lot of telling about the glory and it's like the, glor the eternal glory of God revealed in Christ as reigning king and in control of time. There's the synopsis of the key words right there woven together. So with the background of everything I've just said, let's go to the 18th chapter, which really begins um, kind of the, it's the beginning of the end, and not quite, uh, as I've said many times, the record that John has here we don't have the same type of Jesus praying in the garden with the great agony recorded by others, but we definitely have the time of Judas when it says in the second verse, 18th chapter, and Judas also which betrayed him knew the place for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Now he knows all things. Whom seek ye? And I have this, in, it's an interesting way of looking at this. You notice, like in the garden, back there in Genesis, God knew what had happened, but he's still calling out to Adam and asking, Where art thou? Where are you? Right? The same voice now is speaking in a tent of human flesh. Whom seek he? It says he, he knew. He knew. He knows all things. So he knew they were coming for him. But he says, whom seek he? Because it's the answer recorded, which is typical of John, but typical of something else, which, again, because I've taught on this too, you can pass right by it. 
They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. And you notice in your Bible, he is italicized. They added that. Why? Because the rest of the sayings in John, I am, the I am sayings, I am the door, I am the way, I am the light. And if, you, if somebody's still disconnected from the Old Testament, Moses speaking to God says, who shall I say sent me? You tell him, I am that I am sent you. Now the I am is in attentive human flesh speaking to humankind. And I think it's staggering that John records all the, the things that are out of Jesus' mouth. I am the bread of life. I am the truth. I am the way. And even in his being seized, the I am is still speaking. And there is an element, as I said, of him being in control, which never goes away. As soon as they had, he had said this unto them, I am he, again, it's italicized, he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Sorry, that evangelist that thinks that people fall at his voice or his breath. You got nothing on Jesus. All he did was say, I am, and they went whoosh and fell down. Because for a brief moment, albeit a brief moment, there had to be a startling, only God could say this, or only these are the words of God. Why did they fall back? In a brief moment, they were, it was like they, they dropped their guard on their mission to be almost gripped in that moment of him saying, I am. And I can imagine them all falling back and falling to the ground, being taken in that moment. So you keep reading. And then, of course, he asked them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. And it's very interesting that uh, John is recording essentially Jesus' plea for his disciples to be, to be loose, to not be taken with him. That the saying which might be fulfilled, which he, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having drew his, taken out his sword, smote the high priest's ear, cut off the right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. You notice here, as I pointed out last week, there is no healing of the ear. That's what Luke records. That's why I pointed to the compassion of Christ. Here, what John is recording, he's not really interested in the details of, sorry, of the compassion of Christ, although it's woven through his gospel. His focus is something else. The control that the king of kings has, even in this moment here, as though it, it does not appear. And this is the interesting thing. You keep reading, and... So we have an arrest by the mob, which occurs. And then immediately, we have Jesus before the high priest. And this whole record, which people have fought vehemently, how many times was Jesus presented somewhere? Because one record records this, and another record records that. The main, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. The main thing, which is probably the most crucial thing, is that we know he was brought before the religious authorities, the Jewish religious authorities, and he was brought before the Gentile ruling government authorities. And beyond that, we can argue about who, how many and how much, and that's still a question that people will, I've heard people get into very heated fights about. But what is interesting, and this is what I want to highlight, as tr in terms of control, which may be, as I read this with you, you might say, you can see it a little bit better if that's what your focus is, is when he's brought, when Jesus is brought to Pilate and standing before Pilate. In Pilate's question, it's very interesting. Pilate asks um, in verse 33, 1833, Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? A question is asked. Any other individual would have had to answer the question not by what Jesus does. He answers the question by a question. Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell thee of me? A question by a question. That's not an answer. Pilate answered and said, accordingly, am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? 
Jesus answered, and it's, this is such a profound thing. He answers, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from him. So he's telling him that he has a kingdom, but it has nothing to do with the kingdom that Pilate is even over because this is an even higher and greater kingdom, not of this world. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born. So in, in a nutshell, he says, I, I was born for this reason. There isn't a moment here in reading what John records where we see Jesus backing away or even cowing. He's, he's still in control. Whether you read it that way or not, he's still in control. Answering a question by a question is somebody who's still in charge of the conversation. They haven't bowed down in servitude. And the whole demeanor of Christ as it is recorded here, with something very subtle being said, that last line in verse 37, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Here is something for us as we read the King James Version, but if you read it in the Greek, it would be like putting an ultimatum to the one who's listening to this. Everyone who hears me or is able to hear me essentially is able to know and hear the truth of what I'm saying. They're able to recognize, if they can hear my voice, like in old times, if you harden not your heart, and if you'll hear, it's almost as though right before Pilate, he's placing some form of a challenge, which, if you read, Pilate's question is, what is truth at a later time? But it's interesting that there is never a time here where Christ is out of control, that he's not in control of the situation, which is part of the, the emphasis that John is trying to highlight. Now, there are other things in this. I'm, it's, it's hard to fit this into an hour, so if I'm cut and paste, you can put together the missing things in between. But what I'm saying to you is there are other elements in here that are extremely important for fulfillment purposes. Don't know how you would manipulate this. Finally and ultimately coming under pressure of the people who, by the way, the religious people would not enter in to Pilate's realm for a reason. They did not want to um, dirty themselves and make themselves ceremonially unclean. And I'm, I'm going to touch on that briefly in a minute. But when it is put before the people and the shouts are saying, as it was custom in that day, to give clemency and free a prisoner, and Pilate is all but ready to free Christ. He beats him and tortures him a little bit and is all ready to release him. And the crowd is shouting, give us Barabbas. The interesting thing that John is recording in many ways, remember Lamb of God, he's recording a type, a way, a preference, if you will, of the two uh, goats, the two, if you remember in the Old Testament, one that was sacrificed and one that was taken into the wilderness never to be seen again. The fact that the crowd was screaming for Barabbas and we get focused on that, that they would have rather had a known criminal than had a man who had done no wrong, gone around healing and teaching. But the type that John is highlighting takes us back to the Lamb of God, the chosen sacrifice, if you will. And what is not said about Barabbas as a known criminal receiving clemency is undoubtedly as it was customary in his day, depending on his crime. But most certainly, Barabbas would not have stayed within the confines of the area to which he was released. He probably would have gone out and wandered somewhere where people didn't know his crime and didn't know that he had served, that he might go and start a life somewhere else, which is very much suggestive of a type that John is recording. Go back to the lamb and go back to those. One is the scapegoat. The, the one to be sacrificed, the one to be led out in the wilderness. So even in the slightest bit of types, if you will, John weaves these elements in, and I, I don't think it's an accident. When we get into the 19th chapter of John, we have something that is, I'm going to say, quite remarkable. And why is it? it's remarkable for me? Because I'd never considered this before as I'm trying to look from a different perspective we have the record of 
Jesus being tortured, and then he's brought forth. And we know it's in mockery. It's in jest. It's in mockery, where they put a crown of thorns on him and a purple robe. And Pilate says, behold the man. He doesn't say, behold the king. He doesn't say, behold God. He says, behold the man. Elsewhere, Pilate will refer to him a little bit differently. But here, behold the man. He is arrayed, even though it's in mockery, he's arrayed as a king. Sometimes when you have to kind of process this a little bit, we look at that and we say, what a shame, they were really mocking a king. But in fact, after what is commissioned, Pilate writing a title and putting on it, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and it was written in Aramaic or Hebrew, it was written in Greek and in Latin. Something between the mockery of the crowd and those that put that garb on him and the titulus that Pilate did speak volumes about something that we undoubtedly know it happened. But sometimes things are happening. We read them one way, and we've perpetually read them one way, and I'm urging you to look at them another way, which is why would it be necessary if it is Pilate's declaration Thou art king of the Jews. And it was only to rub in the face of the Jews that they were crucifying the king of the Jews. Then only write it in Hebrew or Aramaic. Don't waste your time writing it in Latin, which was the language of the government. Don't bother writing it in Greek, which was the language of the day spoken everywhere. Why bother putting it into these multiple languages if in a strange way, you're accomplishing a purpose of publishing something that you really didn't intend to publish because it was done in mockery. Behold, here's the king of the Jews. But in fact, you know, we think about the gospel as it's being uh, told later about the resurrection of Christ and go into all the nations. But actually, Pilate became the catalyst for that before they even went out into the nations by posting this. And why, why post it in Latin? Language of the government. Who cared what the government thought? Still today, who cares what the government thinks? <laughs> and you could post it in English and no one will understand. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but why bother putting it in these multiple languages if the effect was only to affect the Jews? Why bother putting it into the language of government and the language of the people, Greek? Why bother? And I've said many times that sometimes you'll, you'll look at something and it, it, it seems like... Um, there, there was an adding an insult to injury by doing this, but in reality, what was being done was the mockery that was being placed on him or the shame that was being placed on them by their mindset, those who did this, including right down to Pilate's sign, were actually propagating a truth in a way that had he just not been garbed with uh, a crown of thorns and not been put on a robe and just left to hang with... Uh, you know, nothing else, and that was it, and no titulus. The guard who, I'm sure people were talking about this, this whole trial that went on and the crucifixion, but even the one who came to pierce his side, would he have read Hebrew? Highly unlikely. Would he have read Greek? Absolutely. Why bother telling the average person in the street who wasn't even involved in this ministry to take down the Messiah. Why bother telling the average person, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews in Greek, for the average man to read or for the so soldier that indeed wanted to pierce and did pierce his side would read and understand so that a declaration there afterwards, truly this, was, this man was the Son of God. So very interesting that the things that we've read and we take for granted here, John is, is there's an underscore here of king in control, of scriptures being fulfilled. Remember, this was my point um, that I was highlighting through all of these um, messages. There are different elements. One of them that I think is probably quite crucial, and I'm going to turn back to it because I think um, we should probably, there's little time for me to do this and enough time to be able to at least put this in. Um, we have the mention of the Passover. And what is so interesting about this is a lot of people have criticized, commentators, preachers, 
I even have friends that I've butted heads with over the years over this about John's recorded time frame of when the Passover meal or when the Passover began to be, and he doesn't say began to be fulfilled, what is important. Remember John's eternal purpose, the king is in control, he's also the Lamb of God, and makes this point to record a time frame, which I said many people say, well, how do we reconcile one gospel that says it was this time and John's pointing it at another time? The reason for John highlighting the specific time as he does is because this would be the time when the lambs would be sacrificed. They would begin to be sacrificed for the Passover. John's interest is not to record, as some would say, maybe Matthew, Mark, or Luke are interested in a time frame that belongs more to the unfolding of the events versus John, who's more concerned to show the fulfillment and symbolism of the timing that affects the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, the time of sacrifice. So his concern is that. So when people say, well, these don't reconcile, they're not supposed to. They're telling details and filling in information that had we not had this, we maybe would not see. We could know in type he's the fulfillment, but we wouldn't know definitively how John records this for us. Finally, what I think is interesting is even from the cross, Jesus is in control. He says regarding his mother to one of the disciples, this is your son. Essentially, I'm telling you what to do right in, in, in plain view, still in control. And you might say that's an awkward observation because he could have been delegating that because he cared so much and he loved them so much, but he's, he's now putting a new uh, last order here. This is your mother. This is your son. Essentially, take care of my mother, which should, by the way, put the, put the boot somewhere in the theology that before the day of Pentecost, Mary was endued with any special power being the mother of Jesus because if that was the case, she could have said, hey, I can fend for myself. I got all kinds of power. I can do all kinds of stuff. I don't need John or anybody else, right? <laughs> just saying. It's just an observation. But it shows the control right down to the last moment in Jesus' final cry, which John, by the way, I would have you note, there is no uh, cry like Luke records, my God, my God, or Matthew records. There are no, we'll call them cries of uh, dereliction or abandonment. But some observations even here that I can't help but think John had in mind fulfillment of the Old Testament, recording these in such a way with these particular details. Why does in the 19th chapter and the 28th, beginning the 20th verse, when it says, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop. Strange thing to record. They could have said they mounted it on a stick. They put it upon hyssop. Again, I go back into my, was John recording it this way? Was this common practice to use hyssop? It may be, or maybe in John's mind, recording this particular detail, which is like the Exodus event of applying the blood with hyssop. And you can say, well, these are common practices, but included the way they are, they become detailed information about even the smallest detail being fulfilled. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And I've taught you that word in the Greek, tetelestai, one word, tetelestai. And when that word is uttered, it is finished. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to you. In control right down to the last. It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You know, he didn't say it is finished and then lingered there for another six hours. The remarkable thing is that Jesus was never out of control in this situation. And why am I highlighting this? 
because as I come back to look at the cross and try and share some of the fulfillment, some of the simplicity, some of what I'd call staggering important details that you can gloss over, maybe you already know them and it, it just becomes part of the whole understanding. The thing that is noteworthy is in his death, right up until his death, he was in control. And take a look at his, when, when he's buried, even the emphasis on being king and in control. Nicodemus prepares this and gives this tomb, which by the way was fit, could be fit for royalty. The way they describe it in their customary practices would have been for someone of a higher standing, not just an average person, let alone you would not have buried a criminal that way. Criminals were not even allowed that type of a burial. And again, you have to keep going back to fulfillment of the Old Testament. How do you get so many pieces? We'll call them pieces of, uh, if you're playing a game of chess, chess pieces. How do you get all the chess pieces to move independently, and yet they are moving in one accord to accomplish a purpose? And they're not wound up like, well, Nicodemus didn't say, for this cause I saved this tomb. And yet, here he is getting the burial, Christ is getting the burial, that would be worthy of someone of great importance. So right into his death and burial, and I'm going to go back now to the focus. And the focus is the control, the eternal perspective, and the control of Christ. And we talk about the death of Christ, that even in his, right into his death, he was in control. And he foretold of his resurrection and said the Father would raise him up. So in control till his death, trusting, trusting faithingly that the Father would carry out his side, never questioning if he would, and he did, which is why the important record of the resurrected Christ appearing to the disciples, even to doubting Thomas, and the main thing I want to leave you with today as we've been looking through each of these records is the glory of God never ceased being in control. The glorious King and Sovereign One, even in spite of being in the world and among the world, never lost control, never had a moment where it was out of His hands and out of control right to His last breath. This is what John is recording. The takeaway for us is something so very simple. I could have just said this in a few words and said, that's my message. But if the Lord in his lifetime, in his earthly ministry, had such great control, my now is not yet come, till the Greek's coming and he says, my now, the hour is now. Now, things are going to start now. Then it tells me that in my life, as a believer, the Lord is in control. If, if the control laid out here in John is and is in such great detail, right down to the last detail of the hyssop being lifted up to give him drink. And those great, or call them, majoring on the minors woven in between tells me something really important. Is your life out of chaos? I'm not asking you to venerate the cross and to bow down and kiss a cross or to worship at a cross. I'm asking you to look at that place where Christ laid down his life to reconcile the world to do the work that would once and for all finish the offerings that the Jews kept offering until the time of the destruction of the temple that could only serve one purpose, to appease one's conscience and mind for albeit the space of a year and one year at a time. And here a sacrifice offered once and for all with something very much more attached to it, the promise of eternal life for those who will cling on by faith, latch on by faith, hold on by faith, but underneath it all, God is in control. I said, is your life out of control? Is it your health? Is it your finances? Whatever it is, everybody, listen, everybody has problems. Everybody deals with, there isn't, if you have no problems today, I would like to come and shake your hand. <laughs> if you didn't come in here feeling sick or have something wrong with you or questions of a diagnosis a doctor has just given you or something that you've been fighting is not quite right in your spirit, Maybe it's a spiritual element. You're not quite where you want to be and you can't get there because for some reason you're trapped in a state. God's in control. If he was in control of these details, imagine the control in the details of your life. It doesn't mean wind up 
and let it go. It means we have to trust that he is. And there could be no greater statement of faith when Christ said, it is finished, and then gave up the last breath than to say that was the exclamation mark. Father, I've completed all the work you gave me to do. I did everything that you did. Now the rest is yours to do because the Father still had to raise him up. And by his appearing to his disciples, the promise that he said in control, the third day God would raise him up like the temple being destroyed and then the third day being rebuilt or raised up again, that came to pass. So what I'm saying to you is it's wonderful to look at the cross and the work which each one of these writers focuses on as an important, integral part of Christianity. But what it does is it lets us look beyond the cross and see the details that are before the cross, his control over the minutest events, and ultimately the resurrection, which this is our promise. Looking to the cross, we're told to pick up our cross daily. I die daily. That means the promise of resurrected life as I faith in him and I trust him to be in control of every single problem. And now I'm speaking specifically to this congregation, to people who are writing me letters or calling in prayer requests and telling me about their issues. I'm speaking specifically to you. Is Jesus Christ in control of your life? Yes or no? Yes, then if he is like the control over history and time, like a perfectly unfolded parade laid out for us in history, you too in your life, although in the moment of things happening, it may not seem like it, he is in control there too. Trust him and he is in control. That is my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.